Good afternoon, everyone. Um, oh, sorry, this is so loud. Uh, sorry for going over last time. I somehow misremembered that we are here until 15 instead of 45. I guess I want to spend more time teaching here. So yeah, sorry about that. And if you see me again being a little bit confused, uh, just let me know that uh, I should I should stop. Um, Okay, last time we were going through the Python tutorial and I will just very quickly go through a few more things, um, but I don't wanna go uh, into every single cell in detail. I did start to talk about the um, PyTorch computational graph. Unfortunately, I turned this off. Let me just find it again. Um, so what I was telling you at the end of the last lecture, uh, lecture was about uh, PyTorch building these computational graphs. And unfortunately, I can't fit this uh, whole figure in place, but this is what I meant by computational graph. So um, here we have uh, as inputs, two dimensional inputs, X1, X2, and then there is a sequence of operations someone has written in PyTorch, like multiplication, then apply logarithm to the result, apply sign to the one of the variables and multiply these things and, and so on. And um, what I want you to remember about computational graphs is basically when you are writing your lines of code in PyTorch, you are in the background building a computational graph that looks like this. And uh, another thing that's important to remember is that then there are, with your variables, there is associated value that you get in the forward pass. So for example, if these numbers were two and three, then two uh, multiplied by three equals six and A equals six. So you will have, as always in programming, just a, just a variable that will um, store the quantity that you have for that current variable A over here. But what's special in Python is that with each one of these variables, you also have associated another variable that you don't actually have implemented explicitly yourself. And that's the gradient value at that uh, node. So when uh, the the when we are calling back prop, excuse me, when we are calling back prop, I'll try to remove this a little bit. Okay, when we are calling back prop, we know that we are taking our weights and then subtracting the gradient um, of the loss function with respect to those weights. So basically what is then happening in backprop is uh, the backprop is taking the value of the variable and checks what is the gradient value and then modifies the quantity in the actual variable to make the gradient update. So we have these two things um, in, the, in the background. Okay, now, um, as I said, we will not be computing gradients ourselves. Thank God, that would be awful. Um, we are just going to use the autograd. And uh, here, I will just demonstrate one thing you might do wrong when you're using PyTorch and autograd, and that's not resetting your gradients. So let me show you with an example. Here we have a torch tensor, uh, just, a, just a number two. And initially, uh, also, when you create a tensor, you, you set requires grad to be true to actually store the gradients uh, for that variable. And this is gonna be true by default, I believe. Um, so we have a, have a tensor that's uh, just a value of two and we haven't calculated any gradient of any function with respect to this tensor X. Therefore, the uh, value of, um, of um, gradient of the ten tensor x right now is going to be uh, zero. Let me just uh, import uh, torch. OK, so see here, you are getting none for the gradient of x because there is not, no gradient we have calculated so far. Now let's define a function i, which is gonna be three x squared. And now we're gonna call the backward uh, on this uh, function. And we are going to print what the gradient of x is gonna be. Now we know that the derivative of this quadratic function with respect to x equals six uh, times uh, x, we know that, right? 
And uh, for a particular value of X being two, that means that the gradient of this function I with respect to X is 12. Okay, I hope you know how to deriv do derivatives of polynomials. If not, check it out immediately as you step out of this room. So gradient now equals 12 for our uh, tensor X. One thing that's important to know is that PyTorch has this property of accumulating gradients. If I had defined another function here, which is, I just set it to, for simplicity, to also be three times uh, x squared. If I call backward on this function, then uh, the value of the uh, gradient of x is going to be 24. And this is basically because the gradient we have calculated of um, derivative of 5 with respect to x equals 12 and derivative of z with respect to x equals um, 12, 2. And I said we are accumulating gradient, meaning, meaning the gradient of the tensor x will be a sum of 12 uh, and uh, 12 again. Is that clear? I do see a little bit confused faces. Maybe, um, let, me, um, let me define another one. Um, Q equals x by x so x square um what is the derivative of x square 2x oops um all right so if i said that we are accumulating meaning uh, uh you know summing the the gradients uh what is going to be a new value of the uh of the gradient of x, given that x equals two, and uh, this derivative is uh, two times x. So two times two is four. What do you expect to see now? Sorry, I didn't hear that. 28. And hopefully that's what we get here. Oh, it's 32. Why would that happen? Uh, okay, let's start again. Well, 24. 28. I, I believe I just clicked the cell two times and then, then accidentally summed another another value. So you see what's happening here and how easily it can result in uh, in mistakes. We are constantly adding values to the uh, gradient variable of our tensor X. Why is this important? It's important uh, for mini badge gradient descent. Uh, I told you last time that with mini badge gradient descent, we are taking the average gradient <laughs> in a batch of data and then making the update. And this is nice with uh, PyTorch because you are aggregating this, um, these um, gradients in a background anyway, so you just need to do the update uh, later on. However, when we are done with iterating over one epoch of data, uh, we should start aggregating from zero, right? We can't just be adding and adding and adding stuff into the gradient. Eventually, gradient needs to be reset and we need to calculate the average gradient in a batch uh, again when we get a new batch. Um, this can be done by setting the grad uh, a value of a tensor to be none, but actually what you are going to be using when you are um, using the actual optimizers like Adam is setting the, um, calling a function zero underscore uh, grads, uh, which I have written here. So zero underscore grad basically resets all the gradients to be zero, and then when you start with a new batch of data, you can start uh, calculating, you know, calling backward, not worrying about aggregating too much, basically. So that's something to have in mind. This is why we do zero grad. Um, let me go over just a few more things. Um, we have looked into tensors. We have looked into basic properties and operations where it tensors. Uh, but in uh, when we write in uh, PyTorch, we usually write this use these predefined blocks that are uh, defined in a neural network module. So you, here I'm just importing the neural network module as NN, 
And then uh, remember how last time I was reminding you of what the linear transformation is. Here, you can just have nn.linear implementing a linear transformation for you, meaning it defines the uh, weight matrix and a bias term. And remember how I warned you about input and output dimensions. This is basically what you are setting here. You're saying that input uh, dimension is gonna be uh, four and that the, excuse me, output, is, output dimension is gonna be four and input dimension is gonna be two. So you have a lot of things we have been talking about already implemented in, in PyTorch. And for example, you have our activation functions like sigmoid and of course relu is going to be there too and you don't need to write the actual equation uh, yourself if you want to put the layers together remember linear transformation is actually not neural network we need a no, no, non-linear transformation you can use this uh, function sequential to put these blocks together you don't need to use sequential you can be having intermediate variables where you create uh, I don't know, uh, you start with an input X, tensor X, then you say uh, age is gonna be uh, when I call uh, linear on X, then I'm gonna have output layer, which is gonna be uh, sigmoid applied to my intermediate tensor age. When you use nm.sequential, you are avoiding defining these intermediate variables. Um, of course, you might want to create your own specialized neural network block. Then so, usually you will use uh, nn.module as your superclass and start from uh, there. This means you will need to uh, use uh, init function and forward function. Uh, here is just an example of how to put, you know, um, a feed forward neural network uh, together uh, with uh, two, two layers. And uh, as I said before, you don't need to use sequential. So here, later on after class, you can uh, kind of compare these two cells. Here, uh, sequential is used, but in another way of writing the exactly same class, uh, you can be defining these intermediate variables, as I mentioned. So here, instead of sequential, we are defining linear, relu, linear two, sigmoid, and so on to be able to call each one of these individually in the forward pass, unlike here where we just called uh, cell.model, which then applies all of these uh, modules in the sequence. So these are two different options you might have um, depending on which one you prefer. Last thing I wanna mention is that we need to optimize our weights, right? So we are not gonna be writing our gradient descent from scratch. We are going to be uh, importing the optimizer from PyTorch. So if you are importing torch.optim as optim, then you can uh, use optim.adam to get your Adam optimizer, which I said should always be your first choice if you need to pick an optimizer. Um, and then finally, we are doing the iteration. We are uh, going over our, uh, you know, uh, training batches of the training data. And this is where that zero graph comes into play. So here we have for loop, which says, okay, you are going to do this many iterations of mini batch gradient descent. Every time you need to set the gradients to zero, right? Otherwise, can someone repeat what would happen if I didn't set the uh, gradients here to, to zero? Mm -hmm. I will keep summing up and my gradients will just become large and larger and large and wouldn't actually do what I wanted to do, which is calculate the average gradient of the uh, batch of data. Rather, it would be uh, how many iterations I had so far times uh, the average gradient uh, that I have calculated before, which is not what I want. I want the current uh, average gradient. So that's that's one important detail to have in mind. Okay, in your, the second homework is released and here you are, in this homework, you are going to be given the word embeddings that we have learned and you are going to then do the deep averaging network, meaning you are going to average the word embeddings and then implement a feed forward neural network on top of it with the hidden uh, sizes and a number of layers that you are going to choose and you know set yourself. So you will do a little explore, exploration of hyperparameters as well. 
Um, and in the homework, we have given you uh, one, uh, one file uh, where we kind of give you a skeleton of how you could be implementing these things for another task without batching. So this is a great starting point. point. Uh, it's written in the PDF, um, the name of the file you start with. You kind of check uh, how, how we have implemented the feed forward neural network there, and then you start implementing it uh, for the um, actual sentiment classification task. Um, and uh, in the example we gave you, there is no averaging of word embeddings. That's something you're gonna uh, need to figure out how, how to do for yourself. What else to say about the, about the second assignment? Um, yeah, I believe that, that that's that. I had the sense after the last lecture that there was some confusion about uh, which model we use to create word embeddings and which models do we use to do sentiment classification. If it's unclear, um, please remember that these are two separate models. So we use one model to create word embeddings after which, and we use a proxy task of predicting whether a pair of words appear together in a context, but we don't actually care about that task. We literally forget about that task and the whole model once we train our word embeddings we just take the word embeddings and usually it's not us who are doing this it's uh, someone had already pre-trained word embeddings and you're just downloading the uh, the pickle file with uh, the embeddings themselves and then the other model sentiment classification model where you average word embedding to produce the input representation of your text there you are just you are defining the model as you wish, right? Like you are setting the number of layers you want, the hidden size and, and so on. Uh, but the other model that we use for pre-training word embeddings have nothing to do with our sentiment classification uh, model. So these are two separate models. Okay. All right, so um, with all of that, we have covered what I wanted to say about basic components of a supervised machine learning for text classification. Uh, we had these, uh, remember, four components, which were feature representation, a classification function, and uh, objective function, and then algorithm that we use to change the weights to, to, to you know, optimize for what we set to optimize. Uh, in colors, uh, you can see what are the changes we have made. So um, we are now using average word embeddings as our text uh, representation instead of those features with counting that you have implemented in your first assignment. We are using feed forward neural networks instead of just logistic regression with linear transformations. Uh, optimization function never changed. We have kept using uh, minimizing negative log likelihood, which remember I said in the case of logistic regression and neural networks is the same as minimizing cross entropy. And the only thing that changed without our optimization algorithm is that we are now doing this mini batch gradient descent instead of doing the updates after every single training example. One thing now when I was preparing for this lecture, I was thinking like how to tell you all the changes uh, that we introduced. I have realized that subword tokenization is kind of something I'm introduced, but then forgot about it. And we didn't really integrate it in our word embeddings. Um, remember in fast text, the library that you can use to pre-train your own word embeddings, you can use their version that is also enriching word embeddings with subword uh, information, uh, but subword tokenization will actually come more useful now that we are going to move into more complicated neural networks. So um, yeah, I just want to bring that up that if you are now confused, wh why was subword tokenization important? Remember, it's a better way to tokenize the sentence, but in your second assignment, you're still working with the word, uh, word level tokenization. Okay. But Subword tokenization is really important and will become our choice of tokenization moving forward. So basically, uh, if you remember how I organized the class, this means that we are done with what I call the warm-up stage of this class, which uh, you might disagree with uh, the description. Uh, but this covers every, basically, the basics of machine learning and deep learning as applied to text classification. 
And now we are going to move into learning about large language models. We are going to start with two lectures that are going to set the groundwork for us. And then we are going to look into key ingredients of, uh, of large language models. Um, before the, uh, excuse me, fall break, we are not going to cover all the key ingredients, uh, only two lectures after we are going to be finished with like, okay, these are the large language models as they appear in publications in 2024 this year. Specifically in this period until the, uh, where, we, where we are going to cover uh, background and key uh, ingredients uh, of large language models, we are going to focus on the period of time in between 2017 and more or less to, to this date uh, or at least to the last year. Uh, so what you now know and um, what you're going to be implementing in your uh, second assignment, I would say this was the state of the art in 2015, 2016. If you wanted to have the best text classifier, that's exactly how you approach it for common languages and uh, not super weird domains, uh, something more like news. And now moving forward, we are going to focus on this uh, time uh, period. And for Covering this time period, we are need to start with uh, two old school NLP tasks, which are language modeling and machine translation. And um, the reason why we are going to mention these is because language modeling, as large language models kind of suggest, is the core task behind the uh, LLMs. And machine translation is actually where a lot of these uh, advances had emerged that then resulted into what we know today as um, large language models. So machine translation switched from more classic NLP approaches to neural machine translation, and that led to many advances that are used uh, to this day. So I will start today and next uh, Monday with this uh, covering this background. And then next Wednesday, we start with the transformer, which will be broken down into two lectures. And it will feel, um, you know, th learning transformer for the first time is never super easy. Um, so um, if we are going to take a slower time, a slower pace and more time to talk cover transformer. And then we are going to go into other stuff that make large language models. Just to give you some, you know, little sense of what what kind of changes we need given what you know right now uh the first thing we uh, you should you know be excited to see changed is that with this neural network over here we have uh, an issue where each one of these words is just average to get the representation of the uh, sentence excuse me not each one of them they are average together to get the representation of a sentence and um this is an issue because as with word counting features, we disregard the word order, right? So these two sentences, it wasn't terrible. In fact, it was great, which sounds positive. And another sentence, it wasn't great. In fact, it was terrible, which is really negative. We'll have the exact same representation because I used exact same words here to produce these sentences, except I swapped the order of terrible and great and the meaning is completely changed. With this kind of neural network where you just average word embeddings, you wouldn't understand that these two are completely different. So this still remains the issue. One thing I will just throw as a side note is that today, um, a lot of feature representations where the word order is disregarded is gonna be also called bag of words because you are kind of you can imagine if I had a bag and you just throw these words there and I say, okay, I, I shake them and that's my representation. That's kind of the analogy people are making. We, you have learned bag of words to mean something specific, feature representation where we count words and that's how in the past that term was used. But just so you know, you know, even if they put, people say, oh, um, if they refer to averaging word appendix as a bag of words representation, that makes sense because you're disregarding the order. So that's one thing we don't like about this. Another thing that might not be obvious to you right now, but that's um, uh, what happens if our input text is really long. 
What if you want to model a contract, which might be a few pages long? What if you want to model a scientific publication that can be a dozen pages long? What if you want to model an entire book, which might be hundreds of pages long? If you're just averaging words, a lot of relationships and long-term dependencies are going to disappear. Your model will not have this information explicit uh, enough. So what we want in our future approaches is that we are more explicitly and better modeling long-term dependencies. Think about a book where you have some character and something is happening to this character, something that has happened to them at the beginning of the book, in the middle and at the end. You want to capture that there has been progress right, with this character. With just averaging words, you completely lose this information. You have no idea what happened at the beginning, at the end, and how these things relate to each other. So this is something we want to see changed. Another thing uh, that I mentioned is that words have uh, some words have multiple senses, meaning multiple meanings. For example, uh, basin. You can have these sentences. The Amazon basin is home to the largest rainforest on Earth. She filled the basin with water to wash the dishes. And the neurosurgeon examined the cranial, I sorry, I don't know how to say this, basing for signs of trauma. I think we can agree that the word basing here, it has different meaning in each one of these three uh, sentences. The issue with all of these approaches we have learned so far is that these, for example, word to vec or different embeddings uh, glove that you're gonna be using in your homework is that we are always going to learn a single word embedding. And regardless of how that word is actually used and what its meaning is in the context, we are always have a single word embedding. In this sense, these word embeddings are static. They don't change given the context in which the word appears. And that's bad because words have different meanings. And we would ideally like to have different word embeddings when the word has different meanings. And this is something we are going to also change in the next, you know, uh, um, uh, lectures. We are going to learn about so-called contextualized embeddings, where each one of these words, occurrences of the word basing, will have different embedding just because they appear in different contexts. Finally, uh, we have learned that we are dealing with non-convex optimization, but our algorithm for optimization is working nicely when only when the function is convex. And this is an issue for us as we, as we have discussed a little bit uh, when I talked about practicalities. One thing we are going to change is making the initialization better. Remember, I gave you one example of how to improve it slightly with Xavier Glodo initialization, but we can do better. Basically, we can change our, we can um, train our neural networks for something, some task, um, such that um, uh, this task might be good for many things we care about. And then the weights we get will be somewhere better, maybe somewhere here instead of here or here instead of here. And then given those weights, those can be our initial point rather than some random weights. And we just continue training our model as we uh, usually do. Just to make that a little bit clearer, so Right now, if you had your classification task being uh, classifying your emails as spam or not spam, that's a binary text classification. You would take your favorite neural network. Right now, you only know about three, four neural networks. You would start with randomly initialized weights. You would give examples of spams and not spams and change the weights with gradient descent. Once you are done with training, you would use that model for uh, evaluation. What's going to change is that we are not going to start with random weights. Instead, we are going to do a so-called pre-training stage. And what I mean by we, I mean actually corporations that have compute to do that. So pre-training stage prepares our neural network for all of us to do this thing. Uh, but instead of starting from random, we are going to start from nicer weights. And one thing that is important for pre-training is that we want to use massive amounts of data. Uh, and this means that we cannot rely on data that's manually labeled by human annotators. Instead, 
we just scrape the entirety of web. And when I mean entirety of the web, I mean entirety of the web. You take the most recent common crawl uh, snapshot and you recognize that you can develop tasks that do not require any manual labeling of these data. For example, you can try to predict what is the next word at a given point in text? What could next word be? You can train the model like that because you know what the next word is going to be. Or you can randomly mask one word and say, hey, predict what word is missing here. So these kinds of object objective doesn't require that we manually label any of this data. And then we can use make use of ton of this data to you know, prepare our neural network uh, for later tasks. So this is what pre-training is. Once that's done, you do everything you have been doing so far, namely just take this network and continue training it with minimizing negative log likelihood on your label data. But instead of starting from random weights, you start from so-called pre-trained weights. And this will put us in a much better optim you know, landscape here uh, as, as it has been shown uh, empirically. Once we do this, we get massive improvements uh, in performance. And just, you know, FYI, the word embeddings are also an example of pre-training. You could have started with randomly initialized vectors and, you know, deem them as a part of your FIFO neural network and change them. That's always an option. But instead you use pre-trained word vectors, right? So you already are familiar with one example of uh, pre-training. Okay, so this is just to give you some sense of kind of changes we are striving to make in these uh, when we start moving to large uh, language models. We are going to learn about each one of these topics, uh, about uh, architectures that consider word order, about pre-training, and uh, what else I mentioned, about contextualized word representations um, in the upcoming lectures. That's not all there is to say about each one of these. I just want to give you a sense of kind of things we are we will hope to uh, improve. Uh, but for today, we are going to start with introducing the task of language uh, modeling. Uh, as I said, uh, the goal uh, is to, um, to use this task for pre-training. It's, it's going to be one of these training objectives where you don't need to label any of your uh, data and uh, you can still change the network in a meaningful way. And this is also a modern way of approaching many NLP uh, applications. We, we approach a lot of things today as text uh, generation and basically what language modeling is predicting the next word and therefore producing uh, text. Okay. So I already kind of hinted a lot about what language modeling is, but let's make it a little bit uh, more concrete. So first of all, I want to make a distinction between so-called discriminative and generative models. The models you have learned so far have been discriminative, meaning we were trying to, we were focusing on building the boundary between classes. The, our view of data was, there are some classes here, let's be the decision boundary in between them and classify these data points. With generating models, your approach to your data is to estimate a probability distribution over, the, over some structure in NLP, that's a sequence of words. And if you can tell, um, okay, these are all possible sequences of words and these are their likelihoods uh, to, to you know, appear in some corpus, uh, then you can also use that model to generate new data because the model can be uh, using um, the principle of maximization of the likelihood to uh, generate word by word, let's say, such that the likelihood of the overall sequence is going to produce becomes uh, as high as possible. So discriminative models usually focus for classification, generating models for generating new uh, data. And now you can imagine why generative AI is a term because we're generating text, images, and audio uh, these days. And therefore, because this is like the focus of AI right now, generative AI has also emerged as a term. 
The task of language modeling is the task of predicting the next word in a sequence, given the sequence of preceding words. Couldn't be more simple, right? Like you have some current sequence of words and you are trying to see what the next likely word would be. Imagine me stopping in the middle of sentence and you all trying to predict what I could say next. And language models or LMs are models that do language modeling. Again, very simple, just models that predict next token in the vocabulary. Because the language models assign a probability to each possible next word or token, they can be used to assign a probability of the entire sequence because we know we can decompose the joint probability of a sequence as the product of conditional probabilities, which we'll again see. Okay, so sometimes you will see uh, language models used as to say, oh, that's the model that gives me the probability of the next token, but sometimes people will say, oh, it's a model that gives me probability of a sequence, and both of these things are true, because you can get one from the other. All right, so why do we care about this? Um, you know, when we didn't have large language models, and now I don't even need to say this is important because it's kind of evident with the situation in the world. Uh, but if we were like 20 years back and I was giving this lecture, then we something I would say would be like, all right, if you know, if you have a model that can give you probability of some sequence and I have a noisy uh, input, maybe uh, I'm having speech recognition and speech can be quite blurry, uh, then maybe uh, the probabilities of what the possible interpretations of the speech would be would help me to give uh, actual transcript of what was said. Similarly, with spelling correction, if I want to notice that there is a, uh, there is a mistake, maybe the, I can compare the um, probability of a sequence with the mistake and uh, the one without or something like that. It is obviously going to be useful for generation, right? If I'm trying to generate text. What I'm doing is just generating word by word. And many text applications, language applications are generation, like machine translation, translating from one language into another. Uh, what's important to remember for large language models specifically is that although this task might not seem anything special, you're just predicting next word, it turns out that models that do predict next word need to learn implicitly or explicitly a lot about linguistic features uh, of a given uh, text that's that the model it aims to produce. And again, going back just to you know uh, uh, bringing the idea of pre-training again, if we are using then the next token prediction task as our pre-training task, it turns out that through this, we learn a lot of useful features that put us in a good landscape in our optimization that when we, you know, tweak our model for the specific purpose. So, you know, this would be traditional way to uh, pitch uh, wild language modeling. These days, this is this is the the important uh, part that by doing language modeling, we are learning a lot of uh, linguistic features that can be useful for many language technologies, uh, including, uh, for example, machine translation, and that some tasks are inher inherently text generation tasks or next uh, word prediction tasks, and that many tasks can be casted as a next word prediction, including classification. You can generate the actual label, like positive or the negative. All right, so first uh, I'm going to introduce Engram language models. These are approaches to language modeling prior to neural approaches to uh, language modeling. Then we are gonna come to the neural language modeling, which will help us then to learn about neural machine translation. And then we're gonna segue into the transformer architecture um, a week from now. Okay, so, all right, what is an Engram? Who can remind me? Yes. Yeah, Engram is a sequence of N tokens. Let's let's try to switch back to the token terminologies. Um, so uh, we have also introduced a little slightly um, 
specialized terminologies for when we have N being one, two, or three. We didn't say one grams, but unigrams. We don't use two grams by bigrams, and uh, we use trigrams instead of three grams. I didn't show you this before, but this is also a neat uh, little um, visualization. So Google had built this uh, engram, a massive engram corpus, uh, engram collection from some massive corpus of books. And uh, you can see here, enter any kind of engrams you, you are interested in, and then you can see how uh, the usage of that engram is changing uh, over the years, which is sometimes neat to see which words are, or which phrases are used more uh, or uh, less. It's just to see, can you do this? Yeah. No, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so just, just drawing out this uh, there because I do like, I do like this, a little visualization. Um, okay, so reminder, what are we trying to do right now is uh, do the language modeling task, which is the task of predicting the next uh, token given a current sequence of tokens. And uh, we want to approach that again by assigning the probability of the next uh, word over all of the possible tokens in the um, vocabulary. So basically, for example, if our history or our current sequence is uh, its water is so transparent that we are interested to calculate the probability of the next word being, for example, the, or any other word in the vocabulary. I just picked one here. One way we could approach this is to say, well, I'm going to uh, break down this conditional probability into the joint probability of the appearing with this history. So it's water is so transparent that the, and then here with the Bayes rule, we know that what's over here, the, uh, the thing we are conditioning on appears uh, in the um, denominator. And we are you're going to use uh, counts to get this notion of the probability. So great, there is that. We take a huge corpus and we try to count how many times the appears with this history. And we just divide it by the number of times that this uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, six gram had appeared in the corpus. What's possible issue with this approach? Yes. Yeah, it's very long and therefore it's likely not gonna appear a lot, right? So if we approach this in uh, approach, uh, getting these conditional probabilities in this way, yeah, we probably won't get a good model because most of the probabilities we are going to have are going to be zero. So the, the web isn't big enough, uh, not even a single corpus, but not even the web is big enough to give us a uh, good estimates of this in most, uh, uh, most, case, most cases. So we are going to approach this a little bit differently. We know that we can't really do this. Uh, so we are going to try to approximate it somehow. First thing uh, is to uh, not do much. Basically here, I'm giving you probability, joint probability of a sequence uh, using the chain rule. We know that this is the probability of the first word times probability of the second word appearing uh, given the first word and, and so on. You chain the conditional probabilities. So here we use probability 101 and this here we use nothing. We just write it compactly how, how to, I don't know when we use the product symbol, that's what we uh, use here. So this is just compactly written what's over here. Okay, so this is what kind of we want. We want to get these uh, probabilities and uh, as we have now seen with this previous example, the issue becomes that these sequences along, like farther you are in a, in a text, these conditional probabilities uh, are less likely, that, uh, less likely to happen in the corpus. And then your, these probabilities become zero and the probabilities of all your sequences are zero and you didn't do anything. So, Instead, we are going to approximate the history as uh, such that we don't consider really all of these uh, previous sequences, rather we are going to consider only a few of them. The most common uh, approximation is to consider only the previous word or token 
in a in a given time step. So here, instead of having these all of these conditional probabilities, each one of these conditional probabilities is going to be approximated by taking the conditional probability of a given um, token uh, with respect to the previous token. So you just consider the previous token, which is of course not the same thing, right? <laughs> right? It's a way way simpler, but it does it does work um, somewhat okay. So this is going to be called bigram model when you are uh, bigram language model when you are using this approximation that you're just going to look into the previous token. Bigram is because you're looking at the current token and the previous token. So two of them make a bigram. And what we have used here, which you might know from, I hope, probability or some other course, is the first order Markov assumption. If, um, you know, Markov chains are more abstract version of all of the math here, where you can say each one of these things is a random variable, and we are uh, then um, uh, having these uh, conditional probabilities, and we are going to uh, just care about um, the previous thing that happened in a Markov chain. Um, so what we are using here is the first order Markov assumption. A general way of writing this, when instead of having here uh, here I use bigram, so we are using a bigram language model. You can use any any n-gram. So if you had any not n equals two, then these conditional probabilities here, instead of looking over all of the history, you would look into only the previous capital N words. Okay, so this is just a more general way of writing uh, the. Uh, depending on which Markov assumption uh, you are taking. If you are taking n minus one order Markov assumption, then this is the uh, n-gram language model you're gonna get. All right, so now let's focus on the bigram model. What happens if I replace all of these conditional probabilities with uh, the approximation? Then each one of them just becomes the conditional probability of a given word, given the previous word, and this, this thing changes slightly. So here you see, this is the thing that uh, has changed. Instead of having uh, uh, all of the previous uh, words, we are just considering the previous one. And similarly, we would do with for uh, n-gram language models, where here, instead of looking at all of the sequences, we look at the capital N uh, previous uh, words. Okay, so, What's important to remember here, among all the things I said, we are now trying to calculate the probabilities of a given sequence of words. We know that we can decompose that as a product of conditional probabilities. We know that, okay, by doing some counting in our corpus, we can get these conditional probabilities. But if our history, the, what, the thing we are conditioning on is too long, it's very unlikely that we are gonna see any of those massive uh, engrams. Therefore, we are focusing on a smaller n-grams, like uh, n-gram of size two bigrams. And in this way, we are going to get conditional probabilities that are not perfect, but are not zero. And then we, when we multiply them, we get the probability of the entire sequence. Okay, and just to make that counting, what I said a little bit more explicit, um, we are going to compute with n-gram language modeling the prob conditional probabilities, for example, in a bigram language model. By counting in a large corpus, such as what Google has done, taking a corpus of mm, all the books that uh, they had access to. And we are going to check how many times we do see this bigram appearing in this massive corpus. So. Uh, one example of the bigram in that sentence we had before is uh, the uh, after after its, meaning bigram its the. So you just check how many times you can uh, see that bigram appearing in the corpus. And because we do want to have the notion of probabilities, we are doing the normalization. We are normalizing by 
uh, the sum of the times this word uh, w uh, that w uh, n minus one the one that's that uh, the last uh, word in the history has appeared with uh, prior to any other word. So how many times it has appeared uh, prior to any other word? Like, or in other words, how many times it's part of a bigram? Which when you think about it, uh, how many times a word had appeared previous to uh, another word is exactly the number of time that word has appeared, period, right? Like uh, there is no difference between counting it appearing in a bigram and it did just appearing in the corpus. Um, it just requires a little bit of mental gymnastics to see that these two things are basically the same. It might help you out if you write it in a sentence, but um, I hope I hope this this uh, makes sense to you. So the conditional probability of a word w n appearing uh, after the, another word w n minus one equals to the count of seeing them together as a background where WN minus one has to precede WN, it can't be after it. We are not looking at those bigrams, divided by the times that the word WN minus one had appeared in the corpus. Okay, how are we feeling about that? Okay, at least you're nodding, yeah. I guess so. I mean, what do you, where exactly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So we're looking at the conditional probability of this word appearing after this word. So here we need to be cautious that we're looking at bigrams where this word appeared before this one, not after. That's that's important. Okay, and then in general case, uh, this is a, a you know same you know uh, just a just a different uh, generalization of what we are seeing uh, over here. Okay, so just to put everything together, we are caring about uh, right now about the task of language modeling, the task of predicting the next word given a current uh, uh, sequence, or similarly, we can say we care about. Uh, uh, calculating the probability of a sequence of, of words. And um, we have seen that, okay, the probability of a sequence of a word is a product of conditional probabilities. We said, all right, uh, if you are gonna do counting approach, it uh, becomes really important uh, to not look into the entire history because all of the counts will be zero. We will have basically a language model that assigns zero to anything with, uh, to everything which is um, useless. Therefore, we have approximated the history by considering only, let's say, previous uh, word, uh, not the entire history. And um, in this way, we have, for example, built bigram language model. And with the, to estimate these probabilities, we use so-called relative frequencies, um, which means that the conditional probability will be the times that bigram appears in the corpus divided by the number of times that uh, previous work had appeared in the in the corpus. Um, I didn't derive this, but uh, what you're trying to do to get how this relative frequency is appear is because we want to maximize the likelihood of some training data. And uh, this is called, uh, it doesn't matter. We are trying to maximize the, the likelihood of our training data. And then turns out that if you do this relative frequencies, uh, it can be shown that those are the ones that are gonna maximize the likelihood uh, of the uh, training uh, data. This is where these uh, things come from. Okay, so this is our Ingram language model. This are how uh, we are going to uh, calculate the conditional probabilities. And then when we do product of conditional probabilities, we get the probability of the entire sequence. Okay, and then if you do wanna predict the next word, for every word in your vocabulary, you are going to calculate this uh, probability. And then you can, for example, take the one which has the highest probability to be the next word you say, I'm gonna predict. That's how you can approach text generation, for example. 
so clear uh, clear so far? All right. So there are still some issues that can happen uh, with this approach. So uh, for example, here, I'm gonna give you um, two examples where I will try to demonstrate that um, the long range dependencies matter and that maybe you need engram size taking Markov assumption where we are considering non-trivial number of preceding words. So for example, here, gorillas always like to groom their friends. The likelihood of um, predicting here uh, pronoun there, so in plural, depends on knowing that gorillas is plural. So here, predicting there, if we had ignored this history all the way to here, the model might be a little bit confused, right? If you have just look at groom and there, would likelihood of the probability of predicting there really be higher than probability of um, his or her or whatever, right? So what we are predicting at the probability of the next word here really depends knowing that the association of this word with this one and that this one is plural. Here, the computer that's on the third floor of our office building crashed. Here, predicting the word verbs crash um, depend on the knowing that the subject is computer. So you're giving likelihood uh, probabilities to verbs where that are associated with computers to be higher. So for computers don't eat, don't walk, don't sit. Therefore, these verbs have to have lower probability, right? But if you ignore that the subject is computer, would you be able to actually have good probabilities here for verbs that are associated with the word computer? Probably not. So we have an issue here. With the very low N, the resulting language model would uh, offer probabilities that are too low for these sentences. And because, um, um, yeah, we would just never see these things. And too high for sentences that fail basic linguistic test skill like uh, number agreement, right? So this is not a good language model. We would model, we would get a language model that's not uh, not good for these cases. What we need here is a six gram model, but you know, to estimate the probability of six grams, we are going back to where I started, where I said, what's the issue here? And then you have said, well, the history is too long. We'll never see this uh, huge engram. So this is also referred to as sparsity, having many cases of um, zero probability engrams that should really have at least some non-zero uh, probability. So that's the, we can take, for example, bigram language model and then um, some of these things would be, uh, have very low probability. Um, no, uh, uh, yeah, other way around. Like if we had actual six gram uh, language model here, uh, these things wouldn't appear uh, enough times. And then uh, what would happen is we would have one conditional probability being zero. And remember, because we are multiplying this conditional probability, the probability of the entire sequence would be zero although that, that this kind of sequences are completely fine under lang uh, English language. Okay, so that's what we mean by sparsity and how to fix that. Maybe I can ask you, how would you fix it? Let's say I decide I'm gonna use a six gram uh, language model and then I see, oh, I have a bunch of these. Uh, I, I do model some things well, but I have these annoying uh, zeros. How, how else could I? avoid assigning the probability of this sequence being exactly zero. Yes? I don't really understand how this would help at all, but I uh, would just give a floor to it. So some probability that it occurs in these signals. Well, that's actually what we do. It's um, if you mean by just assigning slight uh, probability to each one of these to avoid having exactly zero, that's exactly what we are doing. So this is called um, smoothing. Uh, smoothing means now everything become has a, at least slight value, and in that sense, it's a little bit continuous, right? Um, 
a specific type of smoothing where we add these uh, imaginary, you know, little, little probabilities. It's called uh, Lidstone smoothing. And um, it is achieved in a following way. So this is our, remember our conditional probabilities, ignore these, what comes after plus sign. That was the original um, estimation of conditional probabilities we had before. And now we are just adding some small value here denoted with alpha. And here you just, uh, what, what you need to, uh, the reason why we are adding this, this, uh, this thing over here, uh, where V is the vocabulary and the bars next to it denote the, the size of the vocabulary. If you add this in this way, you still have probability distribution. So this is again, just serves to have the proper normalization. But what will happen is that every conditional probability, you add a little value, extra value to it, to all of the conditional probabilities. They all get slight value. If you, if you get, um, if you have, um, if you have, uh, excuse me, these specific values, then this is a reference to specific type of smoothing. Let me check whether this is, uh, okay, it can be one, sorry. Uh, never mind. I was like, okay, we are adding one now. Everything becomes probability of one or higher. That doesn't seem right. But I forgot we actually have taken care of the normalization. So it can be uh, one uh, as well. Okay, so with this type of smoothing, we are adding to every conditional probability some slight uh, additional mass to every single one of them. Another approach is to uh, do not give every conditional probability equal amount of additional mass, rather shave off from some of the conditional probabilities uh, some uh, mass. For example, for some really frequent engrams, you take a little bit from them and give it to the uh, infrequent uh, engrams. And in this way, you still have probability distribution because you just kind of redistributed the, the mass. Uh, but uh, those that are infrequent are getting uh, a little bit. And there is like a whole science behind smoothing. I'm keeping things really short and simple here just to introduce the concept of we don't want zero probabilities and this is the ways we can uh, achieve them. Before we had neural language models, how to do this um, was a big uh, direction for uh, research. Okay. All right. So... Let me bring this slide over here. Um, with Engram language models, again, we were computing these conditional uh, probabilities. And now to avoid the issue of having zero probabilities, we have also added uh, some of the, for example, with smoothing, we have added a little bit of mass to every single conditional probabilities. And now we do not have the issue of ever seeing the zero as a probability of a sequence. All right, questions before we move into neural language model. Yes. So for example, the uh, mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. So how do we have the model to make a crash? Crash in computer. So here we are using the uh the um uh basically the six gram uh language model, or I don't know, assume that these uh, these these words are six uh, position apart from each other. You're using six gram uh, language model. So you have, you know, chance to um, measure the, uh, the probability of crash given this entire preceding sequence that includes the computer. So you are increasing the likelihood to be able to measure these uh, conditional probabilities if, the if they actually appear as engrams in your corpus. Uh, if you had used smaller size for your engram language modeling, you don't stand a chance, right? Because you will never have a computer appearing in your history when you're trying to get the conditional probability of uh, predicting crash, right? So you are, in, you are intentionally choosing a higher N for your engram language model to be able to do this. But you, then you realize, well, I will now have an issue with the zero conditional probability. So let me add a little bit of smoothing 
to kind of try to have both. You won't have both, but at least the zero probabilities won't ruin your model completely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a good point. Why would this kind of counting approach understand the uh, difference between the sub, you know, between the building not being the subject and the computer being the subject? Again, it needs to see enough of these to know that computer had um, is a thing that crashes more time. Building can crash as well, but it's um, such a huge event that um, it doesn't so happen so frequently. And unfortunately, computers crash all the time. So that would be uh, this combination of words would appear more. So I think, yes, the under these conditional probabilities, it would assign crashed um, higher higher probability than some other verbs that are associated with buildings but not computers, which um, I don't know, none comes to mind. <laughs> but the, in, if your whole sense is like, okay, these things are not super powerful, you you are also, also right. Like these engram uh, language models um, maybe are not the best way to approach that. Um, so that would be a nice segue to talk about neural language modeling. So. We are trying to compute these conditional probabilities. Um, and we are mentioning all these issues uh, from you know having zero probabilities, needing to do smoothing, choosing the right engram uh, size to question. So whether the model is capable through this counting capture these um, subject object word uh, dependencies. So now, since I kind of promoted uh, neural networks so much, you might wonder, well, can't we use neural network to do something like this? We have previously had our output space uh, being whatever set of labels, and we had uh, probability distribution over that. What if our output space is our entire vocabulary? Wouldn't, can't we get from our softmax the distribution over the vocabulary and then pick the highest, uh, the, the word with the highest value in the softmax as our next word. And we can totally, totally do that. Okay, so let's go and see how uh, how we can do it. Uh, for that, I will need to return to my fee forward neural networks and see what needs to be changed. We can't really use them exactly as we have uh, been using it for sentiment classification. So first thing that needs to be changed is the output space. Uh, it's going to be the whole vocabulary if we are trying to predict the next word, okay? So this is a little illustration how this can, can work. We could have a beginning, some beginning, special beginning of sequence token, and then we put this into a neural network, and then it gives uh, as a last layer softmax, uh, which gives us the distribution of their vocabulary. And let's say uh, next word is uh, Sylvester being the highest scoring word in our vocabulary. Then we add Sylvester back to our input. Now our you know history is increasing. So we have beginning of sequence and Sylvester. We give that to a neural network. Again, softmax calculates the distribution over the vocabulary. And maybe Stallone is the next uh, word that's um, the highest scoring uh, uh, under the probability distribution and so on. So basically here, what I'm illustrating is that our, our input sequence is increasing or being larger and larger as we are predicting the next word, right? Now, think about your fee forward neural networks and how we did them. <laughs> There we have given, we, we taken our input sequence, movie review, we created word embeddings, averaged them, and then we made a prediction. What is substantially different here? What's the first, like the, the biggest difference you're noticing here? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, our output space is a vocabulary and we're getting the probability distribution. I already mentioned that, so that's not 
the major difference here. So if I do this, what's happening? Yeah. Yeah, it's changing, right? Every time I'm predicting the word, my input is changing. Whereas before we just have a static input, we shoved it once, we got the prediction and we were done. So, and, and here at every step, we care about the entirety of uh, history, right? Like we would like to model the history entire. So we need to change things uh, a little bit. We need to, when we make a, so a representation of POS Sylvester Stallone has, we need a hidden representation that's different than POS Sylvester Stallone, right? Like these two things are not the same and we need to capture that now there is another word that's in the input and it, the hidden representation needs to be changed. Okay, so this means that when we start, you know, we had our feature vector being just one, one uh, representation of a, let's say, movie review. But here it's almost like as uh, at every step, as the input grows, we would need another feature vector. And this feature vector needs to capture what has been generated so far. So, we need somehow to track this history. And here I will very shortly introduce recurrent neural networks that are very, you know, change our feed forward ne neural network just slightly. So if you, uh, first terminology, 10H is our nonlinearity, W and V are our matrices for linear transformation, B is our bias term that I personally usually fold into the, um, into the uh, weight matrices. If you ignore this thing, ignore it for a second, uh, then what you have is basically um, uh, basically uh, your fee forward neural network, right? Like you have uh, current, I don't know why they're using HT and HT here, um, that, you know, th there needs to be some difference. Or they want to say, I'm overriding HD with the new HD. Um, in any case, uh, here we have at the current D, meaning at the at the current input that's let's say uh, let's say uh, T minus uh, one tokens uh, long. So we had T minus one. Um, excuse me, not T minus one. We had T tokens so far in our uh, input and we are trying to predict the next one. If you don't have this uh, this uh, linear transformation here, if you're just taking the uh, current representation of the current uh, token, then um, basically you have fee forward neural network. But here we are adding also the representation of what we had at the previous stage at the uh, H T minus one. And in this way, we are kind of folding both what uh, the current representation is and what the previous ones uh, were. Okay, now that I talk about this, I realize it's a little bit confusing how I go about it. So let me give another description of this. So here you have x1, uh, x0, x1, x2, xt. These were for me beginning of uh, beginning of sequence, Sylvester, Stallone, uh, and so on. So here you start with the beginning of sequence token, and uh, you are at the position h0, and you do the linear transformation of the word embedding of beginning of sequence token, which is a special token with a special word embedding. And um, it, at the first position, you don't have uh, this symbol, so you can just imagine this is a, this is zero for a moment. And you add bias term, apply nonlinearity. You will get the new representation of your token um, BOS. And at top of this, you will have a linear layer that makes the prediction of what the next token is. So at top of this representation you have your 
uh, standard output stuff uh, where the size of the output space is the size of the vocabulary. The softmax will give you probability distribution of the vocabulary. You'd predict whatever is the highest uh, probable token in the vocabulary. And that one goes into the input. So that for me was BOS, Sylvester here. Okay, so X1 is Sylvester. And imagine you have word embedding for Sylvester in your word embeddings. Now this goes into your uh, first layer here, which is you linearly transform the word embedding of Sylvester, but you also add the linear transformation of hidden representation over here, which was in the previous step. So basically what you're doing is you are combining the representation of your current word embedding with the HT minus one, which contains information about all of the tokens pre uh, that were generated previously. Yeah. In this case, so that's just a lot so X0 is beginning sequence, and then H0 is so that's there. H0 uh, would be, uh, sorry, the ages are here just denoting the hidden representation at the current time step. And here, unfortunately, there is no any output layer. So you need to imagine there is another thing going on here, which is the output layer, which gives you distribution over the vocabulary from which you take whatever you want, for example, the highest uh, scoring one, to be uh, X1. Yeah, just checking the time, okay. Um, <clears throat> what's important to recognize here is when we get the hidden representation of, let's say in this step over here, it contains the combination of the word embedding uh, at that time steps together with the representation HT minus one. But HT minus one itself contains uh, the word information about the word embedding at that time steps together with what was previously uh, 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 modeled. So recursively, HT minus one will not contain only information about the previous word, but about all of the previous word, okay? Because HT minus one is actually combination of W HT minus one plus V times H T minus two. And T minus two is, you know, like each one of them is a combination of the current and the previous. So in this way, you are modeling um, the, entire, the entire sequence as it's uh, being uh, generated on fly rather than, you know, calling fee for a neural network independently every time a new thing is generated. Okay, and to finish the issue with the recurrent neural networks and why we won't go into details of them and instead we will learn about transformer architecture is that in theory, they are able to do this, um, you know, we could fold the current representation with the previous one and we remember everything that has happened in the past. But in practice, it has been shown that they are actually not able, capable of remembering the entire past, the entire previous um, sequence of tokens. Uh, so they are not really as useful as we want them to be. Um, because of the nonlinearity and how this is recursively applied, um, this, uh, the, the values become smaller and smaller and the gradients become uh, zero therefore. So these things suffer from vanishing gradient or they can suffer from having two large gradients and they do not parallelize, uh, meaning we need to do this, you know, generate the next one and include it and so on, unlike with transformers. So this is just one, how, one way how to do, to, to, to do the next token prediction with uh, neural networks, but then we are gonna switch to the transformers. So this is just an example of how to go about this. Okay, let's continue then uh, next time. <laughs>